Good morning, everyone. Let's please stand. Sing the chorus. He is Lord. Because he lives. Ladies Bible study has been changed from this Tuesday to next Tuesday, April the 18th. Um, this will be the month that we reveal secret sisters. The food box program will be this Wednesday at 1 p.m. So if you can come and help with that, please do. We have a thank you card from the Davenports. Um, here's a card to say thank you everyone so much for making our day as blessed as it could be. From the emotional support to the amazing feast y'all prepared, it fed our hungry bunch for the entire trip. The bow tie salad did not last long. 
I, Jody, have never felt so beautiful in all my days, and I will cherish that day forever. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Mr. and Mrs. Devonport. <clears throat> and then um, coming off our missions conference, Brother Cody Rich sent a card, a thank you card. Dear Saints at Calvary Baptist, thank you all very much for having me in your conference. I thoroughly enjoyed the time with you all. You all were a big blessing to me. Thank you for the accommodations, gift basket, very generous love offering, and the spectacular food. You all had a great spirit which refreshed me. Thank you for being a blessing. Please continue to pray for for us as we will for you. God speed the rich family. Hebrews 12, 2. That was a great day. It was a great turnout for the whole entire conference. I think that's all I have for now. Hymn number 170, One Day. And on the second verse, let's get around in fellowship. But if you don't get back by the fifth verse, that's when the trumpet sounds. So...
number 234, crown him with many crowns. This is our offering him. <coughs> Number 149 in the blue book, Blessed Redeemer. <clears throat> Yeah. 
walking on the road to Jerusalem that day. The time had come to sacrifice again. My two small sons, they walk beside me on the road. The reason that they came was to watch the land. Daddy, daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. So I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, dear children, watch the land. For there will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must be sure that the Lamb doesn't run away. And I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. And I said, dear children, watch the land. When we reached the city, I knew something must be there were no joyful worshipers, no joyful songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. Then I heard the crowd cry out, As he fell, the cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony and loss until a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed, Carry his cross. I tried to resist him, then his hand reached for his sword, and so I knelt and took the cross from the Lord, I placed it on my shoulder, and I started down the street, the blood that he had been shedding was running down my cheek. Led us to Golgotha, 
They drove nails in his feet and hands. And yet upon the cross I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. I never have I seen such love in others' eyes. And to thy hands I commit my spirit. He prayed and then he died. I stood for what seemed like years, I'd lost all sense of time, till I fell to tiny hands, holding tight to mine. My children stood there weeping, and I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us for the lamb ran away. It. What have we seen there? There's so much that we don't understand. So I took them in my arms and we turned to face the cross. Then I said, Dear children, watch the Happy Easter. You'll make your way to Matthew chapter 26. We'll get there here in just a few seconds. In my reading, I come across, and uh, we told you this story some time ago, but in my reading, I come across a story about the making of the Navy SEALs. And the making of the Navy SEALs is a tremendous undertaking by any human being. These men are forced to undergo strenuous tests, not only mentally, but physically as well. I'll spare, I'll spare you all the details other than to say this. Those men are, are broken down mentally, physically, and they are pushed beyond the point of exhaustion. The reward is at the end, they will be crowned or pinned a Navy SEAL. Now what does that have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with this point as well. Often, when we hear the story that Brother Randy just sang about, sometimes this happens, and, and I, I don't think it, it, we mean for it to happen, it just happens. We that are in the United States of America are fortunate for this reason. Is we hear this story repeated. And quite frankly, it is the story that needs to be repeated. But in repeating it as we do, we have a tendency sometimes just to back away from it. And, and our minds will tell us this. You have heard this, so... Let's drift on to some other activities or some other things that's going on in your life. But let me give you this from the outset. Everything that, that, that is in the world today, I'm talking about everything in the world today, finds its substance 
in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing makes sense according to 1 Corinthians 15 without resurrection. Your life doesn't make sense. Preaching doesn't make sense. Quite frankly, sitting in a church this morning would not make sense if Jesus did not rise from the dead. So with you that are here, the consensus is simply this. We know that Jesus rose from the dead. The reason why we know this is this. Is one, the Bible says it. The another, another reason why you know it is because you've trusted Jesus as your personal Savior. And that's why you know it. Another reason why you know it is because things just make sense once you examine the evidence that Jesus died, buried, and rose again. Now, let me just tell you this. In the world today, there is probably not much disagreement on the fact that Jesus died. That is a historical fact. So even scoffers of Scripture and even scoffers of, of Jesus Himself would, would readily admit that they will give you that point of His death. What scares Satan more than the death is that three days later thing. You see, if, if we can keep Jesus covered up, if, if we can somehow keep Jesus out of the thought process that He did rise from the grave, then Satan has won a great victory. So, with, with all of that said, in my studies in leading up to Easter, and, and by the way, not that this is important to you, but in my studies leading up to Easter, going back several months, we have done a lot of preparatory work, and even before we got to this week, and here's what it meant. As a preacher of the gospel, here's what the desire of my heart is for you every week. We want to preach a message, first and foremost, that God wants us to preach. That would be kind of a novel thing, right? And so we, we set out with that purpose in mind. So several months ago, here's the neat thing about this. Several months ago, boy, I was charting my own course. I was charting the way this Sunday would go. And boy, we were going to, we were going to just get it from point A to B to C and, and everything was going to be okay. The problem with that is, that's what I wanted to do. And man, I tell you what, I got my fancy big fat thick books and I was looking at my big fat thick books and getting all the facts and all of the figures and pulling resources and doing this and shoving them on this spot and getting everything and, and it still just was not right. And for the last several weeks, I have really, honestly, if you here would only know, I have tried to change this message 100 times and I just couldn't do it. I really feel like this is a message of the hour. Thursday I sat in my office and says, God, I just don't know. Surely there's got to be something more than this. So here's what I did. If God wants me to preach it, then I'm just going to leave the results up to God. Even though, it, it's, even though it's not the direction I really wanted it to go, but I really feel like that's the direction God wants us to go. So with that said, there are parts to the story, and maybe you hear that, that, that will be listening to this, you'd say, Preacher, how in the world does this fit with the parts of the Easter story? Well, maybe I won't fill in all your blanks, and maybe I'll leave some low fruit hanging on your tree, but if you'll listen... I think that it will become more clear. 
as we get there. Father, we ask, Lord, in the very few minutes, and I'll not waste no time. I will not try to be a comedian. I will not try to be an entertainer. Father, my message this morning is simply want to be a, 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 a your mouthpiece. Lord, I realize that this message is going to be preached or a message will be preached all over the world today. And Father, I would just pray that in these few uh, moments I have, I pray, Lord, that I'll give it unto thee, unto you. And Father, I just empty myself of any direction that I want to go and totally lean upon the direction you want it to go. Father, I count it an honor. I've counted a privilege to be in the pulpit today. Father, thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 26, we see the Lord taking Passover. And in doing so, or the Last Supper, and in doing so, Jesus said a statement that was probably one of the most bombastic statements in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, it probably was one of those statements that 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 if you are in that particular room, you'd almost want Jesus to repeat it because it seems so unreal. How in the world could Jesus even say what he said? And certainly we understand that it's we're, we're just using <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26. In verse number 21, he says a, he says something that it just seems like it did not fit that particular occasion. And he says this, and as they did eat, he says, truly I say unto you. Now, watch what he says, that one of you shall betray me. And you know each one of them asked the Lord, is it I? And I thought this was very interesting, and you Bible readers have picked this up. But when it came to Judas, Judas did not ask the Lord. He didn't say, Lord, is it I? Judas phrased his question like this, Master, is it I? He said something like this, Rabbi, is it, is it me? Now, wait a minute. Are, are you still kind of awake with me so far? Several disciples says, Lord, is it I or is it I? And then Judas put the part together and said, Rabbi. Now, maybe that's not a big deal to you, but for the, event, for the events that would fold come about later that, that night, that serves to seem to be a big event. Regardless of all that Judas had witnessed in the life of Jesus, now his dark soul looks at Jesus and asks him that fateful question. <clears throat> and I thought it was this. Now, if you're listening, say amen. amen. Jesus said that statement and then Judas says, Master, is it I? And then Jesus simply said these three words, Thou hast said. Jesus then gives some very important instructions for the church today regarding the, the Lord's Supper and regarding the bread and the blood and, and all of that. And it takes place in Matthew chapter 26. But then, not only, listen to this, not only then he says somebody's going to betray me, skip down to verse number 31, and he wasn't finished making a tremendous, another bombastic statement, another statement that had to just blow these guys away. Notice what he said in verse 31. All ye shall be offended because of me. I want you to circle the word all. You see, Jesus knew all of his disciples would, would run away. And that prophecy was in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. And Jesus knew that. Then Peter says these ominous words... Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. And then Jesus looks at Peter and says something, these words, before the crock shall crow, you're going to deny me how many times? Wait a minute, tell me again, how many times? Listen to me. 
Is it not bad enough to deny Jesus once? Then why would Jesus tell Peter, Peter, look, you're sitting in this comfortable room. You're sitting here without any, any pressure on you right now. But Peter, when the pressure comes, when there's going to be something that's going to come to you in a very short manner, not only you're going to deny me, but you're going to do it three times. Now think about the words that Jesus just says. The lesson in this is this. We need to be careful when we begin to evaluate ourselves, believing that we are above some sin or some failure that other people might go through. You see, you know how our human mind works. Come on with me. Our human mind works like this. Well, I could see maybe them denying you, Lord, but not me. I could see, Lord, where some of the people on the outside of this room, and I believe, I believe Peter even thought this. I believe Peter even thought, I can believe everybody in this room would stay true, even Judas. I don't even believe, come on with me, I don't even believe Peter had an idea what was brewing in Judas's heart. Before the cock crow. Wow. Now, with all of that as a backdrop, Jesus comes to a place of Gethsemane, and Jesus says to his disciples these words, Sit you here while I go and pray yonder. Now, that's not a very difficult position to be in. Jesus gives them some instructions. Just stay right here, and I'm going to go pray. And by the way, in doing so, he took Peter, James, and John, you might call his inner circle or the church staff, and these men and our Lord spent a great time together. So all the other guys, these, these other eight guys, he said this. Judas had already gone out of the room. He says, watch. I want you to, I want you to sit right here. Okay, God, Lord, I get that. He gave him the, they, he gave him a command to do, now, if I look, if I look, he gave him a command to sit. Listen to me. The inference was, if I'm going to go pray, come on with me, just pretend. If I'm going to go pray, then probably you should pray as well. So then he gets his three church staff, his youth director, his associate, I don't know. He gets these three guys and says, now you come with me and, and, and you come over here. Are you getting this? So now everything is kind of getting into place for what is fixing to transpire next. Now, the first group I thought was interesting. He told them to simply says, he says, I want you to sit there. Now, the second group, his church staff, he says, I want you. To, come on. Everybody look. I want you to watch. The first group is to sit there. The second group is to sit and watch. You got it. You've passed the test. Maybe. It was not anything beyond their capability. We're told something about the second group. Jesus says that he went to go check on those men to say to watch. And then the Bible says he finds them asleep. All the time the disciples needed the Lord, the Lord was there. Now the time that Jesus kind of needed some moral support, somebody to be in his corner, somebody that he could depend on, what were they doing? They were sleeping like some of you are doing today. I, I don't want to listen. I'd rather sleep because I've heard this all too many times. Perhaps they were on social media. Maybe they were sharing TikTok videos. I don't even know what that is, but whatever that might be. The point was this. Jesus was near the cross and they were sleeping. No problem if you sleep. Nothing but the biggest event in human history is about to occur. 
They should have been able to tell that Christ was a little bit different. Shouldn't they have, shouldn't they have noticed that Jesus' tone was a little bit different? They'd walked with him three years. Maybe his steps was different. Come, come on, everybody, look. Maybe his facial expressions was different. Maybe as he's walking, Jesus was thinking about just a few short hours of what he was going to go through. All he told his men was set. And what he told his church staff was to watch. And he went and checked on those three men and they couldn't even do something simple. The church of the living God can't even, we haven't even mastered it today. We've made you comfortable. We've given you ever amenity in the world to make you want to come to church. And yet there's still people in Milshee, Texas that is still sleeping through Easter. Set and watch. Here's Jesus, the very Son, the carnate Son of the living God. He clothed Himself in human flesh. He left the portals of heaven. He came down to earth. Why did He do that? Because this was the event that would change human history. No, it wasn't anything important to the disciples' thought. It was just one of those peculiarities that Jesus had because He was always praying. Or we're crying out loud. We've heard Him pray before. What's the difference now? The difference now is because the cross. So here he is. The church staff was asleep. The regular church was over there, God doing whatever they were doing. And, 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 and we get the impression that they were asleep too. But that's not the story. That's just the backdrop. Here's the message that I did not want to preach. But here's the message that God wanted me to preach. And it's located in verse number 39. Verse 38, Jesus is pouring out his heart in the garden. And he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. Now watch what he says. Even unto death. Watch with me. Can you just watch? Can you just have my back? I'm going to hang, guys. It's going to be different. The sins of all humankind is going to be placed upon me. Just watch. Look at verse 39. And he went a little further. There's your message for this Easter. He went a little further. So what? I've heard that before. What does that mean? The disciples were content to be uninvolved. They were content to be removed from the scene of this great spiritual need. But here was someone who was not content to be uninvolved. Here was Jesus that was wanting to do what his father wanted him to do. Someone in this passage understood the, pit, the whole picture of what was happening. And it wasn't the disciples, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Right before the cross, the event that would change the reason why we're here today. Jesus had already decided that He was not going to give in. He was not going to back up. He was not going to give up. Throw in the towel. But these sleeping disciples were already dreaming of some kind of future coming kingdom. Jesus in order knew in order to have a kingdom, there had to be a cross. But Jesus came to this world not to stop and to sleep in the olive garden, but to go a little further. If the disciples cared to notice Jesus was literally being squeezed just like the olives in that garden would be squeezed to make that juice. Would you allow me for the very few minutes that I have left remaining to give you this thought? Many today are losing hope. 
They don't want to see, and they don't want to see the need to push on and to keep going forward. We have become accustomed, instead of looking for our spiritual breakthroughs, we instead are sleeping in our comfortable gardens to be a part of the groups that we could always say, well, I used to do that. I used to teach Sunday school. I, I used to be involved in faith promise. Somebody amen the preacher. I used to drive a bus. I used to tell somebody about Christ. I used to be on church on time. I used to be in Sunday school. I used to do those things. Now it's just a distant memory. I can tell you, Jesus did not go to the cross for you to be a used to. To the day, the consensus is this. Preacher, it's too hard. It's too expensive. I have to go too much. I can't understand the Bible. I'm too tired. Too many rules. Too many hypocrites. Too much singing. Too much preaching. I have too much on my plate. Preacher, I would rather sleep than be with Christ. Is anybody listening to the preacher? Preacher, I enjoy my slumber. You don't understand how hard I work through the week. No, I probably don't understand how hard you work through the week. But I do understand what Jesus did on your behalf. I do understand that Jesus went a little further. I do understand that when he went in the garden. And he looked and said, Father. If there's any possible way that I can avoid this. Let it be. But then he said, never the less. Nevertheless, thy will be done. You see, Father, I'm not going to be content to stay in this garden. Oh, it would feel good. It would, it would be so much better on me, humanity speaking. But I didn't come to sleep in a garden. I come to die on the cross. Jesus went a little further. Some of you can't even get to the church on time. Can you go a little further? You can't make it on time. Can you go a little further? You can't get up and do a devotion of a morning. Could you go a little further? You can't even read your Bible and you say, Preacher, I don't understand it. Could you go a little further? went a little further. Could you go a little further in your prayer life, your Bible reading, your financial giving, your faithfulness? Could you determine that you could go a little further in your faith promise? Could you go a little further and just be an encouragement to your preacher to be here when you're supposed to be here? Could you be a little encouragement to, to someone here in this building that is suffering and going through heartache. Could you be an encouragement to go make that visit? Could you be a little bit of encouragement to make that phone call, to send that card? Could you go a little further? Preacher, you don't understand. I'm busy. No, friend, you're not that busy. You have just bought into the lie of the devil where you could sit in your olive garden to be uninvolved when Jesus is going further. What about you? It was clear to a lady by the name of Doretha, but her husband drank too much. What could she do about it? Whenever she confronted him about the problem, he flew into a rage, which only made his drinking worse. Since there didn't seem to be any viable options, Doretha simply tried to ignore the problem and concentrate on raising her son. She focused everything on motherhood, but soon that would not be an option as well. One autumn evening in 1995, Doretha's husband was foolishly handling his gun while he was under the influence of alcohol. His hand slipped off the gun. It went off. And the bullet took the life of their only son. 
While her husband was in jail, Doretha was left to silence and despair of an empty home. She no longer had any real desire to live, but she was also afraid to die. A lifetime ago, at age 13, she had joined the church. But the issues of life and death and eternity were all just mysteries to her. Doretha remembers climbing into her car late one night and driving for hours and hoped that maybe she would drift off to sleep and not wake up. But something happened and that protected her every time. In the daylight, she began visiting churches. It was good medicine at the time, but the effects wore off when she left the sanctuary and came back to the silence of her home. One evening, Doretha at midnight fell to her knees in her bedroom and cried out, like some of us have done in the past. Lord, help me. I'm tired of living this miserable life. It seemed to see, it seemed to her that the weight of the world had been on her shoulders. But having called out to God, she felt something. There was something different inside of her. She knew she couldn't sleep and that's what she did. She slept deeply after that night. She began the next day as a new creature. She felt so much lighter because she called out to God. And she actually looked in the mirror to see that she had lost weight. She saw what the worry and stress was doing to her face. But now something happened. It started glowing. Doretha couldn't comprehend the newness of things. She wanted to understand the change that had come across her. But she was a bit embarrassed to ask. She writes, God changed my whole life. He mended my broken heart, saved my husband in jail, brought me and my husband closer together, showed us how to love and to be loved, and not to take life for granted. Jesus is the only hope of the world, and he still answers prayer, she writes. That's somebody that went a little further. Number one. Why did Jesus go a little further? Because further was in the direction of Calvary. Number one, further was in the direction of Calvary. And that was the purpose he came. He wouldn't, he wouldn't get to Calvary eating popcorn, watching his favorite television show. But he would get to Calvary because he would go further. Let me ask you this. Jesus was there to die for your sins and mine. He went further because it was... It was his father's desire for him to take our place. He went a little further to glorify his father. Today, today some followers and uh, today some people want forgiveness, but they don't want the cross. Today, some Christians want a service, but they don't want a cross. Today, people want easy believism, but they don't want the cross. Today, they don't want to follow Jesus. They just want something comfortable to get out, to get out of the service and get on with their mundane lives. Can I submit something to you this morning? I believe that Jesus called us for more than just a mundane life. No matter what people said or would say in the future, the cross was evidence of at least one thing. He loved you cared for you, died for you, and died as you, all because he went a little further. Sometimes in our life we lose sight of that purpose, and we forget that. Secondly, number one, he went further because it was the direction of Calvary. Secondly, he went further because of his passion. He went further because of his passion. Verse number 38 He says these very, very distinct words. My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. There was always a burden on him and he knew the reason why he came. He knew he would need to go a little further. Before I finish this message... And before you go out through your activities of the day and as you dismiss this message and as some of you will never think about it again, let me just give you this. Is it possible that the church of the living God has quit accepting and quit challenging and quit going a little further 
in our devotion, in our Christianity, and the things that God has called us to do, is it possible we have stopped going a little further? Is it possible that with everything that God has blessed you with, I look around the room and some of you have got a fine home and you've got every trappings of success, but you're miserable on the inside. You've got everything in the world that you could possibly make you happy. And, and, and you can't go forward to Christ. You've got a job. God provides you with income. You're not happy. You, God provides you with, with things and trinkets of the world. You're not happy. Can I tell you why? It's because you're trying to substitute that for going forward a little further for Christ. I can't get out of the bed preacher on Sunday mornings. It's too hard. No, you quit going forward for Christ. I can't be an encouragement to somebody in this room. They might think I like them. No, you quit going forward. Preacher, you don't know the anxiety that I feel. Well, beloved, can I tell you this? If you only knew the anxiety I feel every Sunday morning, then you would understand, I understand where you're coming from. I can imagine, I can only imagine when, when the Bible records for us that Jesus was praying so intently that his sweat became blood. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm just going to tell you, that's kind of a, a, a deep, intense prayer life that probably none of us have ever had. Some of you can just barely pray over your chicken fried steak, let alone praying like that. You see, some of you have gotten so discouraged. Some of you have thought this. Well, it's the church's fault. No, you haven't gone further. No, preacher, it's your fault. No, you haven't gone further. I can't make your attitude and I can't make it or break it. That is something you control. You have not gone a little further. Today, all over America... And even overseas, there'll be thousands and thousands and thousands of messages preached. And there'll be thousands and thousands and thousands of people come to know Christ for the first time. But here's my challenge to them and to you. The longer we're saved, we quit going further. Preacher, I'm old. I know that I'm old. But I don't ever want to not go forward. I don't ever want to stop growing. In my likeness to Christ. I don't ever want to stop and say, God, I've gone just as far as I'm going to go for you. When you went all the way for me. Can I tell you something this morning? For everybody in this room, he went a little further. Well, certainly that don't mean me. Yes, that means you. Not only did he endure the torture of the Romans, and I'll not give you all of the things that I've read and all of the barbaric things that they did to the victims prior to the cross, and all of the ways they humiliated the victim on the cross because that was Rome's way of shaming them even further. If I've told you something I ran across, some of you would be physically sick. Of what I ran across. Of what they did to the victims on the cross. As a matter of fact. I saw it for the first time in my whole life. And it made me physically ill. I couldn't even believe what I read. And I looked at that. Oh God. Have we disregarded your death barrel? And it, it is for naught? And we can't even walk into church on time? We can't even praise God. We can't even lift our hands and tell you how much we love you. Because we quit going a little further. Jesus did die on the cross. He went all the way to the cross and blessed God. After the cross, he went down to the regions of the underworld. And he looked at Satan and said, hand me the keys. Because there's a new sheriff in town. 
Amen. There's a new sheriff in town and I am coming to get the keys. And he came and got the keys from Satan. And then he walked out of that tomb door and to declare to the world that not only did he go further on the cross, not only did he go further in the underworld, not only did he go further when he rose from the dead, he's still going further for you today. Father, thank you for this opportunity. I would to God that somebody in this room would catch that vision. They would go a little further. Father, we become so normalized, caramelized, Christianized, that we don't even know what true biblical Christianity is anymore. Father, I would to God that somebody one man, one woman in this room would determine that they would go a little further. Maybe they have reevaluated their Christianity and up to this point, it's not near where they know it ought to be. Lord, our bodies are tired. People are hurting. Families are crushed. Society is in a in a downward state and people are looking for hope and it may be in you somebody's looking to. Lord, would there be anybody to say, I'll go a little further. 